Hi, everyone, and welcome to No Kill in Motion. I'm here with Shirley Marsh from Yes Biscuit, Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville, Alan Rosenberg from New Jersey Animal Observer. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. We're talking today about a pet shortage or lack of a pet shortage. It really depends on the way you see it. Um, they, there were articles in the New York Times, I think, and um, I've been seeing it online in blogs. Um, most of the information that I've seen has come from kennel clubs, which is obviously in their interest um, to sell animals. Um, but, uh, you know, in my opinion, if petfinder.com and adopt the pet actually exist, there's not a shortage of pets. I can go out there and find, uh, find lots of them. But, you know, there are a lot of opinions on this. I want to hear what you guys have to say. Shirley, why don't you start and tell us what you think? I would agree that there is a shortage of highly adoptable pets in some shelters. And I think that the reason for that is in part due to rescues going in and plucking out the highly adoptable pets. Um, they, there are many rescues, even in my own area, who do this, just go around and get um, specific uh, small dogs, especially. Um, and uh, to me, rescue should be walking into a shelter and saying, give me the least adoptable animal in this place. But instead, they're doing the opposite. And uh, it's leaving some shelters with uh, dogs that that uh, a lot of large dogs, a lot of black cats, uh, things like that that are um, more challenging to adopt out. And, and I think shelters need to do more and better marketing uh, with the pets that they have. Um, you know, just saying, well, well uh, we only have a bunch of big black dogs, uh, so I give up, you know, it is not, uh, is not what sheltering is. So um, a lot of those pets that you see on Pet Finder that are the, the highly adoptable pets, they're from rescues. And they come with very oftentimes um, contracts that are very um, prohibitive to, to many uh, adopters. And they come with price tags that are prohibitive to many adopters. So um, I think uh, I, I, I do tend to agree in, in some uh, places that, that there is a shortage of highly adoptable animals. That's interesting. And actually, you know, I, I do see this in Colorado. We have a lot of rescues. Colorado, um, I've talked about this before, we transfer a lot of pets into the state. And we transfer a lot of puppies and kittens into the state um, because they're easy to adopt. So we do have rescues doing that. We have other rescues that do what you say, which I actually agree with you. Rescues should be taking at least partially challenging animals, if not all. I mean, I like them to do all, but I realize that financially that may be difficult. But all, all I really ask is, you know, take one. I, whenever, whenever I reach out to um, a group because there are 40 cats, um, you know, in a, in a situation where they have to go because uh, if this literally happened two months ago, um, a lady passed away. She had 40 cats on her property. Um, she was trying to be a good owner. And the fact is, I would just ask people, can you take one or more cats, right? That's all I'm asking for, right? I'm not asking you to take all of them, just one or more. So I agree with you on the rescue thing um, uh, that, that we, you know, that does kind of warp a little bit. My problem is that the AK say, AKC is saying this and, and that drives me a little crazy. Aubrey, what do you think? Um, Shirley brings up a good point. And I think we're actually going to cover that in another panel discussion one day. Um, and the topic is going to be, you know, what the rescue community owes shelter animals, because the same thing happens here. What we'll have is we have rescue groups that come into the shelter and they're cherry picking um, the ones that are most adoptable. And and I get that because they, many of them may be foster based or maybe of them, maybe they have limited um, facilities or they, they want those that need the least amount of veterinary care. But I think that for every animal that you take that's easily adoptable, I want you to take one that's a little bit harder to adopt because otherwise what you're doing is what Shirley said, you're, you're essentially taking, taking the best and then you're leaving behind those that are harder to adopt. 
Um, so we can story. agree on that. Um, I do think, though, that all these cries about, oh, my gosh, there's a shortage of dogs. There's a shortage in America. You know, the whole chicken little you know, running around with their hair on fire um, is a as a national issue. Um, dog shortage. No, there's not a dog shortage. Um, I think it was in Axios. I was looking at this morning. Axios has an article that says the demand for dogs is far um, outstripping the supply and the imbalance is continued, expected to continue to worsen. Then there's another article in which Patty Strand, who was on the AKC board for a very long time, is quoted as saying, there are just not enough dogs entering shelters to meet demand. Well, um, if we're talking about not enough dogs as a general principle, um, no, not true. I mean, like you said, David, if you get on Pet Finder um, or if you get on Adopt-A-Pet, you can do a search by zip code and you can come up with all sorts of available animals. To Shirley's point, there may be a shelter that has more of a certain type of dog, but in terms of an actual dog shortage, I disagree. Um, here in our area, I got on Pet Finder this morning before we started talking and um, not just with rescue groups, but in shelters, there are a variety of breeds. I mean, there's puppies, there's middle-aged dogs, there's older dogs, there are dogs with physical challenges. There are dogs that, I, I knew that our shelter recently had a Labradoodle, um, which was crazy. They had some purebred puppies come in. So I think that it, it, it may have to do with area a little bit, but I don't believe there's a shortage. And we've also heard at the same time we're hearing there's a shortage, we're also hearing, oh, all these people that adopted during the pandemic are just returning their pets in droves as if they've gotten tired of them or that they can't care for them because they've gone back to work. So I don't think you can live in the same world where you have a dog shortage. Oh, and at the same time, everybody's returning too many animals. Those, those can't exist within the same reality. Yeah, and I was just listening to Peter Zide on, I think it's Peter Zide, hope I got that name right, on Friday from uh, uh, Pet Point Data that that Alan has talked about several times. And, you know, they, they see returns are up. I, I, it's not dramatic, but they are up. Owner surrender is down though, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, you know, we, 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 but we are seeing animals in the shelter. We do know that shelters are reaching capacity again um, from the data that's available. It's not every shelter in America, but they did a, I think they had 200 people actually answer. Uh, they have over 200 um, shelters i don't know if you know alan how many how many shelters they actually look like at, at pet point i don't know exactly but i think it's uh it's definitely a substantial amount um, okay um we're talking about like thousands of animals in there right so so we know shelters are filmed again and yes there is you know we always know that there's a percentage of the population that wants a particular animal right they want a purebred whatever um and but you know we've always known that they're there. They're not the people we're trying to convince. Uh, the estimates were something like, I think, ten percent of people that are looking to bring a pet into the home are of that kind of, you know, uh, focus. The rest are still open to something. Alan, what do you think about this? So, this whole idea of a pet shortage is based on the pet industry narrowly defining what is a highly adoptable animal, meaning that doesn't include pit bulls, doesn't include large dogs or large dogs that are not purebred or whatnot. So I think it's a very narrow definition of what is adoptable, right? So when I look at this article here, um, I would agree that here in New Jersey, for example, when I imagine in Colorado as well, we're a low intake state in terms of animals from the state. So if you go to one of our shelters, yeah, it's mostly large dogs, a lot of pit bulls, et cetera. But there are some shelters uh, with small dogs. Usually the small dogs do have some little nastiness that most people don't agree. Uh, but as Shirley mentioned, the rescues pluck those out really quickly. So it's hard to adopt those. But yeah, we do have, you know, harder to, I wouldn't say hard to adopt dogs, but dogs that are not 100, you know, the top 10% super easy dogs that the pet industry is claiming. But there are certainly adoptable dogs locally that most people would uh, easily be able to handle. But even if you were of the type of person that said, well, I want something really super easy to adopt, easy to, you know, deal with transport from southern states like we're seeing in Texas and I imagine in the southeast 
those dogs are available. And even if they weren't available, we have plenty of dogs in nearby countries like Puerto Rico and I'm sure uh, the Caribbean, other parts of the Caribbean and Mexico where people were, were dogs could be transported from. So the bottom line is the idea that we now need to let the pet industry breed dogs like crazy is ridiculous. We don't need that. So I disagree with the premise of these articles. And I think also this dog shortage was exacerbated by the pandemic, as we've talked about in previous videos, shelter intake plummeted last year. And even now is still only partially back to normal. So for me, personally, my family, we had to adopt a dog that was compatible with my eight-year-old son and our cat. And we were, of course, we were looking for a pit bull to rescue. And it took us almost a year to find one because of the intake challenges at shelters. So I think a lot of this is, is influenced by the pandemic. And I think that will resolve. So this idea that, oh, it's only going to get worse is false. Intake is going to increase uh, back to normal, hopefully, as the country uh, normalizes and, and this pandemic wanes. Aubrey has one more thing you wanted to say. Alan, something Alan said made me think of something that you said, Shirley, and, and Shirley talked about marketing the animals that they do have, and I would agree with that. Um, I think that there are shelters out there that may end up with more dogs that look like, although we have no idea if they're pit bulls, I mean, they could be boxers, who knows what they could be. I mean, they're, most of them are probably a mix, or medium to larger size dogs, um, because rescues are, are going to cherry pick, they're going to take the Yorkies, they're going to take the I don't even know. They're going to take the beetles, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's still the shelter's responsibility to, to market those animals and, 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 and help them get out. So let's say that you have a shelter and all they have is a bunch of dogs that look like pit bull type dogs. It's not enough just to throw your hands up in the air and say, oh, well, nothing we can do about it. That's when I want the shelter to get creative about marketing those dogs. I mean, talk about, I mean, even if you think some of them really are pit bull type dogs, I think all of us are familiar with the history of pit bull type dogs since the time people came to America. I mean, about they used to be the nanny dogs and how they're so people oriented and how they make great family pets and how they're so popular. So take what you have and figure out how to market those animals in a way where the public goes, oh, yeah, I do want one of those dogs. And to its credit, I have to say that Huntsville has done a really good job of that. I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, but if you go on the Facebook page or the, the shelter's website for adoptable animals and, and you see who they have available, I mean, they're taking great glam photos. I mean, they're doing great write-ups of how they didn't have a foster home. There are a lot of photographs of these dogs with young children, you know, playing with children. Um, so I think it's all about how you present those animals so that people look at them and say, that animal would fit into my family. So I, I, I think it has to do, um, do, deal with who you have, but then invite people to see, hey, it's a dog. At the end of the day, it's a dog. And it, this dog can be a great family pet, regardless of what you may have thought before. All right. We're almost out of time. Shirley, I want to give you one more chance. If you had anything else you wanted to say, look like you did. <laughs> No, I, I wasn't. Uh, I was just listening. Um, I, I think uh, everyone did a, a good job of, of kind of fleshing this out. Um, we, we don't have a dog shortage per se. I think we all agree on that. Um, but we need to get the dogs that we have into homes. And um, I would love to see rescues taking uh, more of the least adoptable in a place uh, and um, leaving some of the easily adoptable ones so that um, shelters can can adopt those out. I, you, you know, that as a subject, I think there's five subjects for other panels. We came up on this one. Well, we have to go. We're out of time. Thank you for joining us today. We had Shirley Morris from Yes Biscuit Blanc, Alan Rosenberg from the New Jersey Animal Observer, Aubrey Kavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. Thanks for joining us at No Kill Emotion. We will see you next time.